Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. I hope you're all keeping well. So, today I thought I would do a different video. Total break from the norm. So, a little bit about myself, the person that runs the channel, who I am, my interest in cars, etc, etc. And a little story and a ramble, I love a ramble, about why I chose a Forester STI as my daily driver. And also, before I forget, um, if you're enjoying the content and enjoying the videos that I'm posting up, please would you... I've always avoided doing this, but trying to grow the channel, obviously, so please, if you would like, share and subscribe and hit that bell so you get notifications of new content, I very, very much appreciate it. Anyway, so, my name's Adam Lovick. I'm in my late 40s. Um, I grew up in Clacton, Essex. Always had a pretty healthy interest in cars. Um, Dad was a lorry driver. My stepfather was a mechanic. He was always getting to go out in sort of fast cars. You know, what customers' cars. And, uh, you know, obviously, seaside town, typical like South End, Brighton, Clacton. Boy racer, uh, the boy racer lifestyle is sort of fairly popular, should we say? Anyway, um, so obviously growing up in the 90s, I passed my test in the 90s, and growing up in the 90s, or being a teenager in the 90s, and having cars in the 90s, you know, it's a good era, good era for um, for cars. The GT, the XR, the RS, the Cosworth. Era, lots of uh, cool little motors buzzing around. Anyway, uh, so my I had a 1300 Escort as my first car, um, Escort XR3 i Mark IV as my second car, probably around about 18. as my first sort of semi quick car. It's a bit rubbish, so I couldn't really afford it. I was only 18 at the time, so um, it wasn't maintained to the standard that I like to maintain my cars nowadays. Anyway, um, at the Ford dealership down the road from my parents' house, I saw a nice little G Reg, or yeah, around G Reg 1990 XR2i. Um, just quite like the shape, you know. I think going moving from in comparison to a Mark III Escort or Mark IV Escort, the XR2i at the time looked quite quite modern. It's amazing, really. 30 years on, they don't look hugely different, but anyway. So, um, yeah, I've got my uh, XR2i, which you would have seen on the channel, and after owning that for about four or five years, and I had finished my apprenticeship in print and started earning pretty reasonable money, and as many people, anyone that's worked in the print knows, was doing bags of overtime and didn't really know what to do with the money in my early 20s so I was just throwing it at the Fiesta and as my stepdad was a mechanic I was just getting parcels every other week exhaust, suspension, wheels, chip oh, the, the list goes on and on and on um, and initially I modded the hell out of the car and then uh, a friend of mine bought in a newspaper clipping and had uh, with an advert for a very very low mileage RS turbo engine so naturally, without hesitation, I went and collected that, and the rest is history. So then I set about um, getting the RS Turbo Lump into the Fiesta and upgrading or modifying anything else that was necessary on the Fiesta. So as I've said on the, the video I made about my Fiesta, it's not a stand, it's not a genuine RS Turbo, but other than front bumper and rear opening quarter windows, it's all as close to RS Turbo as it possibly can be. Anyhow, that aside, in my mid-twenties, I lived close to where I worked. I've always had a keen interest in cycling. Excuse me. I used to cycle to work. The Fiesta was spending more and more and more time in the um, 
garage, which was what I'd always dreamed of doing really. I know it sounds crazy, but I've always mothered the life out of the Fiesta. It had below 5,000 miles on the new engine that I put in. Uh, it had paint and it was looking factory fresh. And uh, so I was cycling to work. Just so happened that the company I work for moved premises and um, you know, this is a long time ago, I can't remember the specific timeline, but for reasons I can't really fully remember, I thought I'll do my um, big bike test, do my CBT again, get my big bike license and get a motorbike. I thought maybe, you know, rather than running an old ratty car, I'll just get bikes. So, you know, long story short, I got into bikes, Fiesta got to uh, get even less miles on her. I was using the motorbike all the time. I had a 600 band at first, and then just really, really enjoyed it and thought, you know what, I'm just gonna get the pin-up bike that I would have had when I was 17. And I thought, hmm, Urban Tiger 5 later. Just quickly found out that the, uh, the pale gray or silver and orange, like my jumper, original, I think it's a Fox High, uh, Urban Tiger is a lot of money. Um, so I went with like a, I've got a tile grey and burnt orange later model of 98. Um, it was the last of the carbureted versions, I think a 9, just over 900cc. Nice bike, fast, good fun. So yeah, I've smoked around with that for a while, was enjoying it. Always been into my um, cycling, uh, mountain biking in my early, to, uh, mid, early 20s, mid 20s, late 20s, early 30s. And uh, we found ourselves travelling from Essex to London, quite uh, sorry, to Wales quite regularly to go to Bike Park Wales, Curly Brennan, uh, Quiddy, etc. etc. And we were often, I wouldn't want to be jamming mountain bikes, no matter how much I dismantled them, there's no way I was jamming mountain bikes into my Fiesta RS Turbo. So, um, we would regularly rent between us, a group of us, we'd rent transit vans. Anyway, I guess in my early 30s, I'd fancied riding the motorbike less, as it were, and wasn't going to use the Fiesta for commuting and was starting to think, right, well, I want to keep the mile. I'm just one of these people that like to keep the mileage off the lovely motors or lovely motorbikes, etc. etc. I like them to be clean, tucked away. And uh, I bought, I think, thinking about it, you know, estates have always been in the family. My parents have always had estates. Uh, my mum's had estates because of having breeding dogs and travelling around the country to um, dog shows and things. And uh, yeah, I, was, I, I got myself a 1.8 diesel non-turbo Escort, I think it was a Mark V, it cost about 280 quid. It looked like an old painter and decorators van. It had uh, more, it looked like they'd spilled every colour of the rainbow in the back. Anyway, that had four new tyres in the service and I smoked around in that for a while. And I really enjoyed it and unfortunately um, it was involved in a a crash, you know, someone pulled out in front of me and I stoked them up the bank, but in the UK, if you do that, irrespective of how ridiculously the other person was driving, it's the person's fault that hit them, which is ridiculous. Anyway, so that car was written off, and it just so happened that um, in the family there had been a Peugeot 405 turbo diesel estate that had been in storage, stroke, in the next door neighbour's farm, sat in the field for six months and it had grass growing around it and all the moss and green in the roof etc etc and I was like you know I need, really need a car, never really been into foreign um, French cars but I thought you know I'll start to get more handy with the spanner and I thought you know I'll make that work. Anyway it did take quite some time to get that dragged out of the field and then connected up to a booster box and uh, it felt like I was turning, over, turning it over for about 10 minutes before it would eventually fire up, but it did. And I probably run that car for four or five years, I guess. And uh, it was fabulous, really economical, really comfy, felt like a taxi to drive. Um, went all right for a 1.9 turbo diesel. Um, 
but in the end I just got bored of the maintenance it was one of those cars where it was really complicated to work on I thought and uh, I see every six months I'd be pulling it to bits and changing serpentine belts and glow plugs and diesel pumps all sorts of things anyway <coughs> excuse, excuse me so eventually I sacked that off and then got the funniest car a 307 Peugeot 307 sport wagon and if you want to be invisible that's the car now that was a nice car uh, cheap to run economical pulled all right um, horrible inside but the thing was um, it would eat clutches and eat brakes even though I was just um, meandering around slowly just taking it easy here there and everywhere anyway um, so I guess by this point I'm probably 42 the Fiesta's obviously still getting used occasionally the fire blades never getting used I had a little scrambler that I loved which I've mentioned but um, that was my oh, I loved that thing it was an old 1988 Kawasaki KMX 200 two stroke fabulous um, but sadly um, that got stolen about two years ago just when I've been collecting bits to do a mild like winter stroke into spring restoration oil change water fluids blah 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 get it up and running get an MOT on it and start getting out on it again because it had just been in storage but um, unfortunately someone had seen that and uh, took a fancy to it and cut a hole in the arms unit and stole it which was a bit of a shame I think I'll always have that itch. Anyway, Fireblade's been sold. Um, and I started thinking, do you know what? I've had the Escort Estate, the Peugeot 405 Estate, and then the 307 SW Estate. I was like, I want something fast. I want it to be petrol, I want it to be quick, and I want to be able to have fun in it. But it can still be massive and still be a estate. Anyway, I thought to myself, you know, I've always loved Fords. ST220 3 litre V6 petrol one. We'll have one of them. And uh, you know, they're for nothing. I started looking around and you get I got a I can't even remember what number plate was now. What year it was. I think mine was a 2003 3 litre V6. And uh, I don't want to suggest that I don't want to upset Fozzy, but I've got a thing about big, fast, ugly unusual cars so thought the Mondeo would fit that bill you know it's a lovely motor it's probably one of the most comfortable cars I've ever driven and you could get your legs nearly straight uh, the power delivery was lovely gearbox was like a Ford a bit wobbly a bit vague uh, it wasn't six speed unfortunately one was the early five speed but um, yeah, it had a few problems you know I'd put a, a big exhaust on it it sounded lovely it went all right um, I did like having power steering um, sorry cruise control <coughs> but it had a few problems weird problems um, and it did break down once right on the entry to the Dartford tunnel which was just mortifying on like, the hottest day of the year about five summers ago and uh, Despite the fact we did get to the bottom of the problem, there was a tiny, tiny little pinhole in one of the brand new, I like to point out, brand new HT leads. There was a tiny pinhole in one, and that was causing um, <clears throat> one of the cylinders not to fire, and then generating excess heat. <coughs> Excuse me, so like many problems, sometimes with cars, you know, you know troubleshooting, microscopic little details, just so happened one day that the mechanic who was working on it spotted out the corner of his eye while it was running a spark popping out and as you imagine I guess uh, trailing or tracing around or out the corner of his eye I don't know anyway when he inspected it and bent the pipe you could just see a little pinhole fracture um, so as I say these were brand new so it must have been a manufacturing defect anyway fixed all that car was running sweet it had no engine warning lights or anything like that but I'd kind of lost the love of it unfortunately and I think you know it had some rust at the back back door bottom of the back doors and being a Ford you know it's never going to last forever anyhow I had been looking at and this is the clincher I think I've been looking at cars on the internet 
and I'd been searching things like fast cars for under 10 grand and I was thinking you know cars that can do 60 in 5 seconds 140, 150 mile an hour top speed massive estate ugly obviously uh, a little bit of a left field choice random choice shall we say an unusual choice and uh, you know 300 brake horsepower plus would be nice anyway I'd always fancied uh, an Audi RS4 event um, they don't fulfil the ugly part uh, they're rather beautiful but uh, when I started looking at them you're looking at to, uh, to get if you're only spending 10 grand you're not going to get much beyond a 2004 2005 plate and the thing is whilst they're wonderful and I'm sure they're built great if they go wrong they cost a fortune so I discounted looking at those but anyway one of the lists I was looking at there was a, a little bit about the Forester and I thought I, I remember it's funny maybe these idea, this idea was planted in my head years and years before but when I lived in Chelmsford between the age of 30 and 39 well maybe 25 and 39 ish um, I'd seen a World Rally Blue Forester with gold wheels must have been probably pretty new back then anyhow um, and I always thought quite oh, wonderful I've always liked Subarus when I used to go to tracks in around 97 I still see my flyer at home somewhere um, in my paperwork storage tracks 97 or maybe a sticker in my Fiesta history book anyway um, I always remember when you know you'd have the Cosworth group go out on the track for a couple of laps and then you'd have the GT Turbo Owners Club go out for a couple of laps and the Escort Turbo group go out for a couple of laps and then when the um, Subaru guys got out for a couple of laps they'd not get round to the whole lap and they'd all be sent off <laughs> because they were all mental drifting around sidewards smoking up all the time and it was just always made me laugh um, I think Subaru people are these days you know they seem mechanically minded very friendly it's very much a sort of group community spirit nice um, but I guess we do drive fast loud noisy um, cars Anyway, a friend of mine uh, that I used to go to car shows with, I've worked with him for years and years and years, and we used to go to car shows quite a lot, cycled together quite a lot. He had a 1998 R-Reg Subaru Impreza Estate, the wagon. And uh, we used to go to a lot of the car shows in there, and it was just stunning, just stunning. I loved it, absolutely loved it. Apart from, I thought, a bit crap. But hey, it's got hard suspension. Um, not exactly Audi build quality. Anyway, he up the he was um, he had it a couple of years and he was thinking of part X in it. And um, the day he bought it in, when he was going to take it into part X, I was working with him on Saturday. He said to me, uh, "Give me the keys to the Subaru." I was probably quite young then, you know, in my late twenties, I guess. And he said, uh, "Take it out, have a drive on part X in it today. Drive it however you want. It's all serviced up." Uh, ready to rock and roll, valeted, etc. It's a dry day, take it out. And I was, you know, sat behind that scoop with the, the handling characteristics of the four-wheel drive, and I just thought, do you know what? This feels like I'm in my dream car from when I was a kid. And uh, when I was a teenager, obviously 18, 19, 20, when I was looking at XR2Is and XR3Is and this turbos, Renault 5 GT turbos, Uno turbo IEs, that sort of thing, um, some of the older lads in their sort of mid 20s, late 20s, were buying Sapphire Cosworths, and only one person that I knew at the time on the circuit had a Escort Cosworth. And funnily enough, you know, as we matured in our out of our teens into our 20s, some of my mates bought Sapphire Cosworths because in the 90s. You could pick up a Sapphire Cosworth for, I think, a mate of mine had a G90 4x4 Magenta Sapphire Cos, about three grand, and it was stunning. But at that point, I wasn't interested because I was pouring up my heart into my Fiesta. Anyhow, back to the Forester discussion. So, thinking about looking at sub-10 grand cars, 
um, three hundred brake, sub five seconds to sixty, preferably. And as I say, with this, um, I've always had a love for Cosworths, and as we all know, I mean, five, ten years ago, I was looking at Saps. I thought I'd even tolerate a left-hand drive white Saf from France, but you were still looking at eighteen grand, and they had copious amounts of problems, you know, like um, uh, armrests sagging, roof sagging, door cards missing in the back, leather flopping around all over the place. And I was thinking, you know, I don't want to buy problems, I want to buy something that's kind of modern and parts are still accessible, um, you know, something semi-current. Uh, so, as I say, with that vision in mind of an experience of driving an Impreza estate and seeing one close to where I used to live, I said to my I started reading about these and I watched, I'll put links to all the videos that, of videos and reviews and websites that drew me to having one, but one of the ones that was really important to me was the um, fifth gear Impreza versus Litchfield Forester STI. And, uh, it's just fantastic and I've probably seen watched it like 20 times or so and that got the bug going you know they were like fit a dog fair wife kids loads of gubbins in the back uh, picking kids up from the school run take stuff down the skip on a Sunday but do handbrake turns and tear around like a mad thing on the track at the weekends if you wanted to and I was like, oh, it's, it's just, it just sounds such a compelling, um, such a compelling offer, if you like. I wasn't going to do the track thing, but you know, I certainly would enjoy and appreciate the um, the performance. Anyway, I said to my missus once, I showed her a picture of it, and said, uh, oh, I really want one of these. And she went, you ain't having one of them on the drive. <laughs> Which really, it's funny, it's like a typical man thing. I mean, that's like red rag to a ball. You think, well, I'll definitely get one of them now. Anyway, I'd kind of parked the idea. I'd been looking around covertly, still running around in the Mondeo, and I'd been co covertly um, observing the Forester market. Anyway, I guess when I found mine, you were looking between eight and 12, and I think four years ago, the pinnacle of the price I saw was £13,000 at an uh, import specialist in Harlow and they had one on 54,000 miles in World Rally Blue and it sort of ticked all the boxes and I kind of fancied it. Sometimes when you see things like this and they sit on eBay week after week after month after month you think it can't be quite right, it can't be. Anyhow, I don't even rem remember um, how this cropped up it was an auto trader it was an ebay uh, we all know that prices are a little bit inflated on ebay but i looked on the i think piston heads and i saw the auction uh, the advert for my one and it was a older mature gentleman probably living this was the key thing he lived just around the corner from me uh, sorry he lived just around the corner from where i work he's like a 10 minute uh, 10 mile 10 minute drive which meant I could just buzz over there on my lunch break, have a look around it and have a test drive, but well, let him take me out. Anyway, so um, it had 76,000 miles on the clock, full history, uh, it had the printout from power station for 323 brake, can't remember the talk, but I could put a picture of it in there um, towards the end, in one of the slides at the end of the video. Um, as I say, full history, new tyres, new brakes. And, you know, it looked pretty clean. It looked pretty clean. So I went and had a look, and as soon as I clapped tyres on it, I was like, oh, oh I've got to have it. It's lovely. Anyway, led look round, and I was telling the guy I was an enthusiast, and I loved the motor, etc., etc. It's lovely. Not enormously well looked after, and not enormously well valeted, really. When I say not looked after, it wasn't valeted. He clearly had a book of um, the mechanical side of things, and it was always serviced, etc., etc. You know, had its... It, it, it had been having it since he owned it, it had been to talk development international. So it had all the relevant oil changes and the standard kind of Subaru love that these need. Um, and it had been run on the right oil and all that kind of stuff. 
anyway, but it wasn't cared for in terms of the valley inside of things. When I first got it, it was in need of some deep cleans in the valley, which I love and enjoy. Anyhow, so he said, take your out for drive. Yes, please. So I um, went out for drive, and this always fills you with confidence with someone driving a, uh, a hot, or modified, tuned, performance turbo car. Start it up, let it run for a bit. Lovely. Down the road, night driving with Daisy. Temperature coming up. Outbound journey, just drove it like a regular car. Felt nice, the suspension felt hard. Felt nice to be a passenger in. Had that burble, um, the scoop, you know, it felt good. And uh, we turned around and uh, nice country lane, got it inferred, and he just looked at me and went, Are you ready? <laughs> yep. And opened her up, and you know, I haven't had a car, at least down for doing 60 and under five seconds. I've never timed it, and uh, I think the drivetrain, the diff, and the clutch, and the gearbox will thank me for that. Um, but in third gear, rolling on. 30 mile an hour, foot to floor, they have a fair amount of pulling it, enough to definitely make it feel like the seat's trying to swallow you up. Nice. So that was it for me. I was absolutely sold immediately. It was like, right, that's it. I've got to have it. And uh, this is, I'll, I'll get very close to the end of this um, waffle, if you like. But um, one thing I've always found interesting about this year, is that um, I bought the the Forester, and as most people will do, I had Bondeo ST220 was still taxed and insured, and the Forester STI was taxed and insured. So they were both at home, serviced, MOT'd, um, cared for, looked after, ready to rock and roll, should we say. Anyway, you know, looking at the two, it's so funny, I thought the Forester was gonna be massive, but next to the, ST220, the ST220 looked cavernous and the ST220 was like leather heaven inside and as I said earlier, very very comfortable and I looked at them both and thought am I making a mistake? Anyway, so I pulled the uh, Mondeo off the drive and took the Mondeo round a local loop where I might go if I've cleaned the car or serviced the car or not used it for a week or want to get some juice in the battery or whatever. It's just a nice little loop, a little bit of dual carriageway, a little bit of country lanes, fast twisties and a little bit slow and then home. Anyway, I took the Mondeo out and as I backed off the drive, it was like, oh, it always felt like a jag. Squishy suspension, wallowy round the corners. You get on the gas, there's no being pinned to the seats. I mean, these were, they were probably I think, from memory, just below 7 seconds to 60. You know, I drove it and I was like, this is wonderful. I must be crazy. What am I doing? This car's amazing. Lovely, comfy, fast, everything you could want. Only cost two grand. Not a huge investment. Anyway, then took Forrester out and was like, do you know what? They're just, it's like a different, a totally and utterly different beast. I suppose, really, the Mondeo was like a, going from a Tourer motorbike to a fire blade. You know, you're going from really comfy, squishy, long journey comfort to something really focused. And that's how the Forester felt, really. The steering's a million times better. The gear shifting is incredible. It's like the bolt action on a really, really good rifle. The brakes are miles better. The, there's, the suspension's miles better. It sounds better. It's significantly faster the handling twisties and back roads worlds above there is no way you'd throw a Mondeo ST220 into some of the corners that you can throw a all wheel drive Forester STI into and uh, that was kind of how I arrived here I mean I've said in my other video where well, I think in one of the earlier videos about when I've had a rambling session about the Forester ownership. I think it's probably one of the first videos I've put on. Just wonderful, just wonderful. It's a funny thing. I mean, you know, I was saying about having a liking fast, ugly, boxy cars. Well, with that said, and the Forester is a, 
I suppose, let's say, a bit marmite. You know, some people are like, you don't get noticed in it very often, other than other Forester drivers or maybe the odd Subaru driver. Not even really like, uh, you know, Japanese car fanboys really rarely look or say hello. It's kind of weird. But um, I've had one old boy come up to me in a garage forecourt and sort of said, well, I don't see many of these anymore, which I seem really strange. Maybe he'd had a XT, I don't know. I give him the benefit of the doubt. Anyway, the ownership has been sensational, obviously. I bought mine on 76,000 miles. It is now on 133,000 miles. So, 56,000 I've done in it. And part of the reason for that is, I've had it four years, part of the reason is it's like a truck. I'm, miss, I'm going to pick up my daughter today for the fortnightly visit. And uh, my missus said to me last night, you take my car if you want to save some money. She's got a 22 plate, 4,000 miles new uh, Suzuki. It's cross hybrid, semi hybrid. And um, it's all right, but you know, this is my chance to spend some time in the forest. It's mad. It's like a drug. They cost you a fortune in petrol. Um, as I service it every 5,000 miles, as I've discussed in previous videos. So, as those miles are ticking away, I'm at 133269. So, in 1,700 more miles, oil and filter. But I look forward to that. It's another 100 quid Fuchs 1050 Pro Race S, genuine Subaru filter, probably a some nut, some washer, as I always do. Because why not? <laughs> it's eating enough money just driving down the road so it might as well have everything it needs in terms of fluid and service equipment but it's, it's, it is like a drug i just can't get enough of driving it and um that's why i'm piling on the miles it's crazy really i've never obviously you can't look back or work out how much it would have cost to cover that amount of mileage using only v power but there you go it's uh She's not a garage queen, she's not a carpet queen, she's not in heated accommodation. She's just a, a day, it was always going to be, I can afford a car about 10 grand, I'll go drive it every day, irrespective. I do mother it in terms of cleaning, jet washing underneath, Lano guard underneath to keep the bottom uh, waterproof. Um, a little bit sort of moisturised, the Lana Guard's good, it soaks into any dry, crusty, crusty areas and helps to rejuvenate them. So just when I say crusty, like the diff casing or the um, suffering, you know, just getting some Lana Guard into those areas, it soaks into the metal, produces a, like a, a waterproof seal and, uh, you know, I'll make some videos of that in the spring, I'll get underneath the jet washing again, Lana Guard it all and, uh, show you the difference between covered in salt, jet washed and snow foamed and then Lanagard and let it dry and the difference is incredible. So you know touch wood that will uh, keep the calm going on UK roads through the winters uh, for another number of years. Anyway as I say I hope that's of some interest. It's a little bit of get to know my car history, get to know the person behind the channel, get to know my enthusiasm and motivation behind cars, etc, etc. Um, where my love of the Subaru comes from, and uh, yeah, just to get to know me a little bit. If it's boring, skip forward. If you enjoyed it, hit the like button. Um, if you want to see more, press the subscribe button. If you want to get notifications, hit the notifications button. And, oh, one last thing starting to get systemized and proceduralized with the videos so we're going to get videos every sunday 1 p.m no fail until further notice or run out of things to make videos about okay cheers everyone thanks for watching have a great weekend take care bye bye